what's up, SC Nation? This is an interesting time we're living in, where many people are getting let go of their current roles, and yet many companies are still hiring. And I talk to many people, and it is not a fun thing to be in. Whether you're experienced, you have 20 years of experience, or you just started a brand new job as a sales engineer, or you're just simply looking for a sales engineering role, your first one, it's, it's hard. It's taking time, and I want to talk about whoops, some of the things that are that I see people doing that are slowing down them finding a new job. Now, generally speaking, experienced sales engineers are good at finding new jobs because they see it for what it is, which is a sales cycle, a sales funnel. But for the new SEs who were just hired and then they had to be like, go, or people who have been doing this for a while, it's a little bit more difficult. So I want to share some of my thoughts around this. Nine things that you're doing that are actually slowing you down from getting a job. And more importantly, what you could be doing instead to find a different job, find a better job. So let, let me just actually move you and put you up here. Might be a little bit better for me. I'm looking there. Again, notepad, trusty. So let's talk about this. Um, one of the things that I see people do and they focus a lot on is having the perfect resume. Resumes don't get you jobs. Right? What get you jobs are people. Right? Some resumes do get you jobs, don't get me wrong. Resume is not completely useless, but if you think about the 80-20 rule, which means 80% uh, of your results come from 20% of your efforts. The resume is not in that 20%. What is in that 20% is your network. If you have a good network, if you know people, if people want to help you root for you, they will help you find a job. You might need the resume to apply for the job that you were just referred to, so it needs to be in good shape. But trying to get that resume up to 100% perfection is just slowing you down. Whereas if it's at 80%, if you get referred, in many cases, you might the hiring manager might not even look at your resume. They will just interview you. It's happened to me a few times where I get through the interview process and at the end, when they want to give me the offer, they say, Ramsey, can you go and formally apply to this job and send us your resume? So I tend to do that. Uh, so what you need to do is build your network, whether you're currently in a job you, and you never know what could happen tomorrow. Tomorrow you might not be in a job, unfortunately, and the way layoffs are happening or just you just wake up and you don't have access to your computer. Sometimes, sometimes it's they, they tell you you have to March or February or whatever it is, but start building your network from today. And if you're out of a job today, lean on the network that you have and also start building the network, make it bigger, make it larger, meet more people. Um, SENY is doing a meetup in March. Um, I'll leave a link in the description, but Chris White is speaking there. I hope I can make it. I don't think I can, but you never know. So that's number one. Uh, people spend too much time fixing their resume. Number two, when they do fix their resume, their resume is a job description. Don't do that, basically. <laughs> right. Uh, job description is great, but a job description means that anybody can do whatever you just listed in the job description. What you want is your impact. What has your impact been for the companies that you've worked for? I've said that on multiple videos. I'll continue to say that until I'm blue in the face. You have to show your, imp uh, your impact for whatever company you worked for, whether it is as a sales engineer, you've hit your quota, if you were in support, uh, like you've reduced or you've worked on an ex extra extraordinary amount of tickets, or if you're not even in sales engineering at this point, or in tech, what has your impact been to the companies that you've worked for? Maybe you're in sales and you've closed more deals. Maybe you're an SDR or BDR, which stands for sales development representative, and you've set up more appointments. Maybe you're in retail sales and you close more deals, Wh whatever it is, just find your impact so that you can highlight that. Also part of the resume stuff. So the third thing that I 
see people do and slows them down <coughs> is their skills are boolean as in they either know something very well or they don't know it <coughs> and what that means is they might have python on their resume and they don't qualify that like I know Python a little bit, I know Python a lot. So some people are worried that they don't put Python even if they know it a little bit because they don't know it. And that's Boolean. That's either you know it or you don't. But in fact, we have different set, uh, skill level at for the different uh, skills that we have, right? If you know Python very well, you can say I'm experienced with Python. If you don't know it very well, it's like working knowledge or familiar with. And you, I'm not asking you to lie about anything, but if you, people are worried that, oh, I if I say Python, I'm going to be grilled on it. And you might be if it's uh, in bullet point format, but you might not be because it's in, uh, if, if you tell them like, hey, I'm familiar with, I'm not an expert in any means in the resume. And why that's slowing you down? It's because you have an ATS, right? If, you're, if your network is not finding a job and you still want to apply, you want to give yourself the best chance to actually go through the ATS, which I don't know what it stands for, automatic something, the resume something, I don't know. It just looks at your resume, looks for keywords, lets you in or, or it doesn't. And you want to beat that in one way, shape or form so you can talk to a human being because skills are learned. You don't grow with the skill. You don't wake up and you have a skill. You learn leadership skills. You learn technical skills, you learn sales skills, so all these are learnable, so just don't put it in Boolean format. Now for the interviews, well, I see a lot of people who go through the interviews and get rejected, whether it's one, two or three interviews. Um, so what slows you down during the interview and things that you shouldn't be doing, and I'll start with number four is, uh, you shouldn't answer your, question, your, your questions, the questions you're being asked with facts, which is a weird thing to say as sales engineers. Um, facts are important. Facts are actually the most important thing in the world. Nobody remembers them. Nobody cares for some reason about facts. Everybody has their own facts, my truth. But if you can tell those facts in a story format, talk about your accomplishments. We were, I was talking to a gentleman and we're talking about like, hey, when they ask you, tell me about yourself, what do you say? It's like, oh, I did this course, I did this class, I did this, uh, I worked here, as you can see on my resume. It's like, they, if they can already see on the res on your resume, you're wasting a chance to actually tell them something else that facts ba based, but as a story, as in, I was the first of three kids to go to university, and because I went there, my my brother and sister were encouraged to go. And, and do university as well, and I and then worked uh, uh, as a, well, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he worked as a fundraiser or something. He did he did outreach. He did work in Haiti after the hurricanes, but he never mentioned any of that in the in his uh, tell me about yourself question. And we went through that. We talked about it, and now he has a story to tell the facts about himself that highlight his strengths, which are. Like he can do any work, he's he he's overcome challenges and all that. So don't answer just just with facts. Another thing is that slows people down during interviews is we answer in hypotheticals sometimes because we're asked the question, "What would you do if this happened?" And our response usually is, "Well, I would do this or that," but. What we would be better is if we think into our past and see has anything similar happened to whatever they're asking, and can I share that story? I, I've had interviews where someone asked me like, "Hey, if you had like sixteen customers come come at you and tell you different, and like everybody's mad at you, how do you deal with that?" I didn't have an example like that, but I had an example that was similar where I had one customer that had multiple issues and they were pissed off and we were going to lose them and they're a big customer. So I switched that question from that hypothetical, which I've never had, to this one situation where I had one customer that's very pissed off, more than the 16 people combined, 
could have been, and I told that story. So I answered in a story of something happened to me. Another thing that I see a lot of people do is for the question, how do you like to learn and study? And they would say, well, I like to learn by doing this or that. And they don't talk about the things that they have learned, how they have learned it already, because you must have learned something throughout your life. How did you learn that? What was the process for you to learn that? Answer in something that's real, not something that's hypothetical, because hypothetical is a hypothetical. Real is something you can highlight that I've already done what you're asking about. And you, know, you can have that discussion. Uh, another thing during interviews as well is uh, don't wait till the end to answer, uh, to ask questions. The, I know that I've had a good interview when the interviewer talks more than me because I'm asking all the questions. I'm highlighting, I'm trying to find out exactly what they're looking for. And then I highlight my strength in one way, shape or form. But it's, it, it's more of a conversation. The more I feel like I wait till the end to ask questions during those interviews, I feel like I didn't build enough rapport with the interviewer that I'm able to actually ask throughout. And it feels more like an interrogation than a conversation. And I always want my interviews to be conversations. And the reason this slows us down is if you didn't build rapport, and that's the main, the gist of it. If you didn't build rapport and they don't like you, like really like you, they might not want to continue the process with you. People don't want to hire people they don't like. Or they would prefer to hire people they do like than people they don't care either way whether they're good technically or not. Like that could be competing, a competitive advantage. Um, don't leave the interview without next steps. Right? Uh, there are a bunch of questions that I like to ask at the end of the interview. <laughs> I, one question that I'd like to, I like to ask is, do you see a reason why I wouldn't be a good fit for the job? Uh, and here, frankly, I'm trying to qualify myself out and I'm trying to see where I stand in this interview process. Am I doing well for them? Do they think I'm a good fit? If they don't, if they see a reason why I wouldn't be a good fit, I can either challenge it or handle the objection right then and there, or I can tell them like, yeah, you know what, you're, you're right, I don't fit. And that helps me end the conversation and helps me understand where, like, I don't have to worry about the next interview because I don't fit. That one person thinks that I don't fit, they could be wrong, but I know that they're gonna vote against me at some point. And if it's a hiring manager, then you're done. If it's a colleague, then you might have a chance. If it's a salesperson, again, you might have a chance. But understand the, understand the interview process. And at the end of each call, what are the next steps? When can I follow up? And the reason I do that, and the reason when people don't, it slows them down, is now when they don't hear back, they're too afraid or too worried to follow up. Whereas if I ask, when should I expect to hear from you? And when can I follow up? I've already set the expectation that I will be following up and I don't have a problem with it. Like I'm not worried about it because I already told them on the call, like, Hey, I will follow up with you. And if I don't hear back, so there's that. Um, number eight on my list is, don't forget to follow up as in not follow up in a few weeks, but follow up with a thank you email. Uh, a lot of people say like, Hey, you should send a thank you note at the end of the email. Yes, you should thank the person that you interviewed. I like to follow up with meeting notes because I treat each interview as a discovery call. They're trying to discover about me. I'm trying to discover about them. I'm trying to understand why they're looking to hire. What's the perfect candidate look like? Uh, what happens if they don't hire and I take all these, I write them down in, into notes and then I share them with the person that I just interviewed with while highlighting why I would be like, Hey, what are you looking for as a sales for, from a sales engineer? We're looking for this. I write that down and then I provide my answers. Like I would be a good fit because of this, this or that, as we discuss on the call. So I provide my meeting notes and that seems to have differentiated me from a lot of other people. So people like that. Um, and the last thing that slows people down, well, not the last thing, one of the last thing I have on my list that slows people down is, uh, people sometimes put all their eggs in one basket as in 
they know, like, they know in their hearts that they're interviewing for the job. That's it. I am going to get that job. And then they don't. And then they have to go find the next opportunity, the next interview. Whereas experienced salespeople, experienced sales engineers know that it is more like a sales funnel. The interview process, finding a job is a sales funnel. It's trying to manage sales opportunities where as salespeople and sales engineers, we might need to close 10 deals to hit our quota as People trying to find a job, all, we all only need we only need one to close one opportunity to have achieved our quota. So we need to treat the sales, the interview process, the, the finding a job process as a sales process, which means we need to fill up our funnel and get as many leads as possible, and then qualify them out and get to the panel interview and get one offer. But if we wait. So like we went through the process, we didn't get the job. Let's get the next one. We went through the process, we didn't get the job. You're just doing things uh, consecutively instead of doing it uh, in parallel. So do things in parallel. What are your thoughts? What do you think is slowing people down from getting a job? What's slowing you down? And how? what can you do to overcome it? If you need help with that, reach out to me. Uh, I have the SE hotline that I help with that. So, yeah, if you like this video, obviously, like it, uh, share it, subscribe it, comment if you have any questions. I've received great feedback in my previous video where I talked about SDRs, didn't define what SDRs were, and a couple of people asked me, hey, what's an SDR? Define what you're talking about, which is kind of common for sales engineers. We should know that, but we all make mistakes. Anyways, that's it for today. Get back to work. Peace.